Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke reaching out to you, uh, and uh, today I'm doing a video on a slight disclaimer. Uh, some time ago I did a video about how we can take SSD drives in either an NVMe format or SSD style uh, uh, 2.5 uh, inch drive combat, uh, compatibility formats, build them out to make them fit into NAS devices and saturate the I.O. bus. Uh, it's a way to think outside the box, which is the mission statement, right? And also on top of thinking outside the box, you also wanted to think about the nature of how you were doing things um, and just optimizing and having some fun. But there is a disclaimer. And so that's what this is about. So when you take an, MV, an MVME style configuration setup and use what's called a pairing card, this is a pairing card, and right there you can see where the MVME sits on the card and it's fully compatible to SATA or SAS and you're gonna stick it in and it's so light and, uh, and functional you actually could probably just let it sit on the contact without any support and it should be okay as long as you're not jarring your NAS really hard or in any way shape or form uh, but usually NASs are able to spec for 2.5 inch versus 3.5 inch in their caddy designs as well which is also valuable because then you can go the alternate route and use a 2.5 SSD drive. Now, why? Well, as you can see here on the bus connector, that bus can only do so much I.O. And spinning hard disks have a hard time optimizing and taking all the I.O. bandwidth that the bus offers. So it allowed us over the years to do a lot of, um, shall we say, specialized uh, setups where we could uh, load up a system with a god-awful amount of hard drives and and it would all work. I mean, it wasn't very fast, but it would be no faster than the total sum value of the I.O. of the motherboard or the NAS uh, bus interface. And with that being said, you know, when you look at a NAS bus interface, as you can see here, you have your SAS outputs here. And normally when a NAS device can do a SAS or SATA, they have a SAS internal bus controller on board, or you can have even more, as you can see here as necessary. And what this does is it gives you the ability of being able to parse out bandwidth across many hard drives. So this is a server chassis, a 730 chassis as you can see here, and it has some drives in it. And these are three channels of four sets for a total of 24 drives. And um, with that being said, you know, 888 eight, eight, and so on, those three channels segment and break down the bandwidth. But when you're going to do NAS and you have cheated and you're going to put NVMe in, please understand that you're doing it for fun because you're not going to get what you think you're going to get from it. The reality of the fact is, what is the restriction and effect that you have with NASs? I'm going to point to it right here. See it? It's an RJ45. One gig at best 2.5 gig bandwidth. If you have two of them on board, you can adaptively load balance them to get you closer to three to 3.5 gig bandwidth. But trust me when I tell you, an NVMe works in bytes. It takes eight bits to make a byte. And there are, these have bandwidth of megabytes up to gigabytes of bandwidth. So when you're working with a network connectivity model, and your network cable has, you know, a crap five cable in it, and the NIC interface to your your switch, and so on. Unless it's basically a 10 gig switch, like you see here, using 10 gig copper five, uh, copper RJ45, which is right here, you're not going to get any of the added bandwidth that you'll see in regards to your NVMe. Now. NVMe is extremely powerful, very fast, and can saturate any bus we have in the industry. That's why NVMe's have to be, uh, well, that's why they have problems with bandwidth, because only a couple of these really can be paired together correctly on a PCIe uh, version 3 or 4 bus and still give you the performance levels you want to expect from NVMe. When you start adding more NVMe's to the equation, that dramatically uh, just uh, well, actually, the reality is, is you don't see anything more. It just stays the same because the the interface bus has been saturated. 
understand that a, that a controller, may it be just a simple HBA controller or, or a hardcore burst accelerator uh, RAID controller like this MVME RAID controller, they will only do X amount of high I.O. bandwidth that which inevitably will not re give you the results you're expecting from a Cat5 1 gigabit or a 2.5 gigabit connection. Yes, you have a lot of stovepipe bandwidth inside the NAS that can never get outside its box, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It just means you need to look at your NAS in a little bit different kind of way. A lot of the NASs that come out today have ARM processors with quad or eight stack processors, or basically subprocessors, inside them. And if you do use MVME as your principal disk storage capacity, and that NAS device allows you to have a localized boot USB or MVME uh, data card on board to offer a faster boot process, then what you've got in your hands is actually a home server. Which means that if it's like a, a Synology or a, um, let's say, like a Western Digital to platform, their, their uh, storage operating system would allow you to add plugins that can allow you to do things from virtualization to running services and other things. And then, yes, all that back end communication on that drive capacity is so fast that the NAS would never ever experience a direct outbound impact to the users. In other words, there is so much extra bandwidth inside the NAS device that you can use it as is more like a home server they would have like two or three virtual machines, one running a streamer and one running an X server that can do uh, some additional services for you that you want. And um, they're running on that extra bandwidth in the background. You're still serving up storage capacity at the maximum output. That's the only thing you should expect to always see constant is on 100% bandwidth minus your overall overhead of you know using a one gig connection. Remember, one gigabit connections have an overhead for the headers and the, you know, the ending points of the packets and so on. So that packet telemetry absorbs about roughly somewhere between 12 to 16% of your bandwidth. Um, and yes, it varies because of the types of traffic you might be experiencing. So with that being said, still, um, the mission of this video is to say to you, hey, it's great that you experiment with NVMe, but you might realize you're gonna have to do some other things instead of what you initially thought of just having super 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 fast storage access the only way you can improve upon that is to add a 10 or a 100 gigabit pipe and most devices that are NASs are pqf or they're soldered on the logic board and they won't come off to, to allow you to swap that out so you do have a limitation based on your internet connectivity both local and external which can impact how that would work so with that being said this uh, short little video was to talk about, you know, yeah, it's really cool that you did that with the NVMe stuff or with the SSD. Uh, and yeah, man, you just pegged it. You know, you, you're, you're great. Your uh, SATA controller, your SAS controller is fully enabled. All the bandwidth is there uh, locally wise. Uh, and remember, you know, so with that being said, and understanding the nature of some things which are out there for you, Unless you're in a tier four or a tier six uh, electrical specialist, uh, electronic specialist to be exact, who can resurface a NIC interface off of a circuit board, this is absolutely the de you know, the death of the device, is the limitation of the bandwidth of the device. The only thing you can do right now is really maximize the effect of the bandwidth internalized inside the NAS to provide you other, other services and so on. Well, the other thing that you might want to consider doing with that is if you do say, hey, I'm going to do what Brad said. I'm going to go out there in my Synology and I'm going to start loading up all these little home server functionalities. Uh, make sure you take advantage, if you have this, you should, I think, most of them have this, that you ALB the two ports, port one and port two, or alpha and bravo. And uh, adaptive load balancing, or ALB, is the terminology I'm referring to because that actually can give you just a squeezy little bit more bandwidth on the single switch. And you can only get the bandwidth to the other side is if it's in an infrastructure that can support it. In other words, if you take a little Netgear switch and you take two ports and you connect them up and you ALB them, it's only good for those eight ports. So you gotta connect another server or something up to it with two connections too, and they can see each other locally. Uh, if you have an advanced switch, uh, a Nortel, a Bridge, a SET, a Cisco, whatever, 
you can actually set up teaming groups and the teaming groups will allow you to communicate the bandwidth across the trunk that you have between your switches. In this case, let's say you have a 10 gig fiber connection between two switches. So you can support three environments of 3.5, 3.2 gigabit bandwidth. And no, by the way, you cannot get um, the multiplier effect of 2.5 gigabit being 5 gigabit on the other end because you lose you know 20 percent of your bandwidth so that's why it's lower just as a reminder on that restriction that, that's in that particular situation so with that being said i just wanted to just kind of put a little bit of you know structure to the eagerness to go to mvme it's a great idea it's cool to learn realize how standardized true protocols really are because if you build something to a protocol it's going to work it may max out your environment but that's okay that's a good thing right you're giving new life to old gear and that's the mission statement reinvent this stuff into new stuff and you know learn along the way that's the reason why i do these videos i, I do them for free to help technical people who want to get more technically savvy and more functional the only last piece of advice I can give you is look at the chipset of the NIC. Make sure that you download the manufacturer's support manual for the chipsets for your NICs if they have dual NICs. They may require specialized configurations uh, that would only be known by the manufacturer's notes in the manual. So um, if, for instance, you're going to use with an Intel Pro Series chipset or a Broadcom, uh, it pays to you know do your research on that so that you can get the right segmentation, jumbo you know pre jumbo packet framing, and all that good stuff set up correctly so that you get the maximum effect when you start to team up your NICs. With this being said, I'm going to say God bless. Hope you guys have a great weekend, and you take care. The next video will be about the construction of the actual 7910 OEM platform, and then the last part will be the diagnostic states. I'll let you go and take care. Bye bye.